Have you ever seen a turntable that doesn't have a platter? I have. It was called the Meitner AT2 turntable, and we had it at Sound by Singer, a store I was working at in the 80s. And it was, to say the least, an incredibly unusual design. First, because it didn't have a platter. It had a clamping system that clamped the label area of an LP. But the rest of the record was floating in free space. Um, the turntable didn't have any kind of suspension system at all. It just sat on these large, what looked like tiptoes, these gigantic tiptoes, cone-shaped things that came to a point. Um, it didn't really have a base because the, the, the turntable was in free space. Um, the arm was a unipivot arm. Now the thing is, the arm was the most normal part of the turntable. But the thing is, without a platter, the record wasn't flat. Because as people have pointed out, when you put a record, even a warp record on a platter, it does sort of flatten it a little bit, just the weight of the record on the platter would flatten it. But since the minor turntable didn't have a platter, it just kind of wobbled around <laughs> as, it, as it turned at 33 and a third. Now, the logic, I think Ed Meitner's logic, it was designed by a guy named Ed Meitner, who designed, was pretty prominent at that point for designing electronics and later, shortly thereafter, of the turntables time period, he did, did some incredible digital converters. Actually, I think the digital converters were out at the same time as the turntable, his first few digital converters. But anyway, this turntable, I think Ed's uh, goal here was he said if you play a record that's sitting on a, on a platter, that some of the energy that's in the record, in other words, the stylus is in there tracing the groove, and some of that energy that's now into the, you know, the record is vibrating a little bit from the stylus vibrating, is going into the platter and then reflected off of the platter. And I think that was his goal here with making a turntable, a, zero, a platterless turntable, was that it wouldn't have that reflection. And I think that may have had some validity because when we played records that weren't too wobbly, it, it did sound pretty good. But most records were just kind of floating around there in space and they weren't very happy being clamped in the center. So it wasn't a totally crazy idea, but it was a pretty crazy idea. And I think he only made like a few of these turntables, maybe as few as 12, I read on the internet if that's true, or 40, something like that. Not, not many of them. So it's unlikely you'll ever find one now because uh, this was more than 30 years ago. But he was that kind of guy. Ed Meitner was an out-of-the-box thinker. I mean, his preamp, the PA6i and the STR50, I think those were his first two products, were the first two that I became aware of and I, and I bought, actually, and I used those. They came... Uh, they didn't have a metal chassis. They were like a, in a mahogany sheath case that was around the amplifier. And they were much smaller than most electronics at the time. Um, they sounded really good. They also had a remote, a wired remote. But even so, most high-end products didn't have remotes in those days. So the wired remote was really cool. And the wired remote had a, a, a knob a volume control knob on it, not buttons to go up and down, but an actual knob, which I really liked. Um, it was a very cool looking product. It sounded really good. It was smaller than everything else at the time. Uh, I think its size, its small size, which should have been a selling feature, um, was people said, well, why is it so expensive when it's so tiny? Well, because it's good that didn't fly so well. But Ed went on to uh, design a speaker that we also had at Sound by Singer briefly that had basically, as I recall, it was a flat panel speaker, kind of like a MagnaPan, but instead of having a distributed voice coil across the panel, it had a, uh, a voice coil in the center of the panel that would basically move the, the whole diaphragm from the center. Also, pretty good product, didn't really fly. Um, but Ed's, I think, real success was in digital converters, and he's still making them, um, and they're still really uh, highly sought after. And he was also heavy into DSD. He likes DSD a lot, and his DSD converters are um, pretty near, or are state-of-the-art. I remember Sony, the company that basically invented DSD, 
uh, was a big supporter of his and, and I think bought his, his, his DAX, his DSD DAX. So Ed's uh, quite a guy. I remember he once came to my apartment. I was living on 71st and Broadway to do an update. I don't remember if it was on the, on the preamp or the power amps. I, I think the power amps. But anyway, he's, he brought his soldering iron. It's a little bag of parts and he sat at my kitchen table and wired in those resistors or capacitors. And uh, just a really sweet guy. But the thing is, you know, that's, that's what's so attractive about high-end audio is these guys uh, who think out of the box. That, that was what's, that's what Ed does, you know, and still does. So um, one of those guys, one of those guys that makes this industry what it is, an industry of quirky but really uh, amazing people. My name is Steve Guttenberg. This is the Audiophiliac Daily Show, and it does come up daily. And though I don't mention it often enough, I do have playlists listed on the uh, homepage of this YouTube channel. So the playlists have lists for uh, uh, speaker reviews, headphone reviews, uh, music reviews, and of course, the ever-popular Audiophiliac of the day. So uh, check those playlists out, and I will see you back here again very very soon. Thanks for watching.